One of the most insidious parts of a more disorganized, historically called, or anxious attachment system is the often outside-in orientation. And if you watch my channel, you know what I mean, but if you're new here, welcome. What this really means is that because of the nature of our parents, inconsistencies, chaos, lack of predictability, whatever it was, we didn't really know what was gonna happen necessarily on a, on a spectrum from like moment to moment. From sort of low end, the parent goes to work and has different schedules, you know, there and not there, to emotionally there and not there, to all the way up on the higher end, like a clinical experience, with a parent with rage issues, things like that. So basically we have these dynamics where we learn to focus on the other first and it becomes who we are. It is an outside in orientation as Dan Brown and David Elliott talk about it. And I think this makes a lot of sense and it really aligns perfectly with the concept of hypervigilance because hypervigilance says, I must stay in a scanning state on guard, seeking detection of threat at all times. And so these two are basically the one and the same. This orientation says, not only can I not be good until you're good, but I'm really taking all of my even nervous system cues often off of you. So the degree of your hypervigilance and fight or flight might depend upon the exposure in childhood to this spectrum of things like a lack of predictability, you know, eggshell parenting, things like that. But the bottom line is that it sets us up to not only watch others, read others, over and interpret others, but to really often be compulsive caretakers because we are only good when you are good. And this plays out, I really believe, for traditionally, and I don't wanna get into the political dynamics of this, I try really hard on all of my channels and pages to not share what I have my own opinions about for the most part, but that historically women being the caretakers, and even if a, you know the research shows that women are working full time and their children, for example, even if they're not, historically we tend to do the bulk of the caretaking. And so you have this you know, gendered expectation, this societal, this cultured expectation. And also I think that, you know, every individual, regardless of how you identify, has some degree or comfort of their own capacity to be nurturing and nourishing to to other people, to the, to a child, and even to themselves. So the problem is you have this deep setup that says, A, you know, you, you, you're supposed to be a caretaker, let's just say, for many people, and that's the expectation. And then if you had a childhood where not only in the childhood did you have to monitor and manage because of things like rage or lack of predictability, you might even have in the own in the home a very gendered expectation as well. So let's say, for example, historically, well, the boy children do these things and the girl children do those things. That's I'm talking about historically, the you know, stigmatized, stereotypical, what we're supposed to do. So basically you have all of these layers that say, I have to focus on everyone else first and I have to take care of them and how happy or not they are determines whether I can be happy or good or not. And it manifests in often a lifetime of chronic mental and physical health issues, exhaustion, depletion, resentment. I do believe that it is a large reason why that so many marriages begin to burn out when people get, regardless of who you are, and one does one thing and one does all the caretaking. And as someone who has been a full-time stay-at-home mom of four children with, with a little bit of help, to someone who was basically, in, you know, had full custody of four children ages one to nine, I would say technically 90% in the early years and 100 for the majority of the years, and was putting myself through a doctoral program and working and doing all of it. I personally think that um, it is in some ways, I'm just saying, I'm not saying for all of us, but it, in some ways going to work is actually easier. In a very gendered dynamic, if your job was to go to work and make the money and you did nothing else around caretaking the kids, around you know being supportive to your partner, around the chores, the home, you know, when you're at work, people say, oh, you know, let's have adult conversations, let's crack jokes, let's have lunch, let's be, you know, maybe respected or not. But when you are full-time home, and I really believe this is also true, uh, while I hold in my heart the belief that 
a healthy, safe attachment that a, a child can depend upon is the most important part of the early years, and fr frankly, all of the years. Um, because even if you have a great, safe childhood attachment in the beginning, but you lose that, we know that affects people. The dilemma for most women historically, and I, I'm kind of rambling, but the dilemma has been you have to, you know, be there, and yet you also have to provide for yourself in many homes. And so the bottom line is that you're doing all of these jobs, and at some point, when you are the primary caretaker of most everything, and you're alone in it, and especially if you feel unappreciated and unsupported, it really does build a lot of physical and mental health issues like anxiety, depression, chronic illness, autoimmune disease, I do believe cancer, diabetes, and the research does show that trauma can contribute to an increase in our physical illness throughout the course of our lifetime, beginning in childhood, possibly, and going all the way through because we can have trauma our whole lives. You basically have a situation where the burnout happens so much that we are exhausted and depleted and have nothing left to give. So the reason why I've said all that before I get into the quiz here is that you have to understand if you are waking up in your life and you're like, I've been the caretaker, I'm so tired of it, and yet you love your family or your partner or whatever, and you don't wanna stop, but you feel so stuck, or you're sick a lot, and so you retreat to your bed. You know, wherever you are on that, I really want to go through today what that looks like and really validate that for you, and, and please and, and really truly encourage you to try to do some work on healing that, and we'll discuss that at the end briefly. I'll give you some things to work on, some things you can seek out. But also, if you are a younger person and you are looking at, you know, I can't wait to be a mommy or a daddy or a parent or whatever. I can't wait to be a caretaker. If you're not really aware, in the beginning, I think it can feel very healing to think that, you know, I've always talked about for me, like I didn't have that. My mom was a full-time working mom. I was an only child. I was a latchkey child. And I wanted to be that full-time stay-at-home mommy, like driving the van, you know. Uh, I wanted all those things. And yet, when I look back at it, it did a huge number on my sense of self as Kim, as the woman, not as the mom. Uh, it did a different issue with my marriage. That's a different conversation. And I think that's also obviously related, first and foremost, to the partner I chose. But the bottom line is that you need to understand that there is no glory in setting yourself up as the ultimate sacrificer, caretaker, the giver. You know, I say to clients all the time, like, you're not this holy thing that's supposed to never have any sense of self. You know, you are a human being. And so it is really important to check yourself, especially if you're looking to heal childhood wounds where you didn't get the caretaker, so you wanna be the super parent or the super partner. Um, it's a lot, it's, it's, it, it will take a toll. And so looking at how you wanna manage that and try not to become a compulsive caretaker is the goal. Okay, let's get into the questions. I know this is a long intro, but I really want to hit home about how important it is. It's not just, oh, are you a caretaker? It's that there are lifetime impacts to being in this role. And there's also something really beautiful about being a good caretaker. And so if you're someone who, you know, who does identify with the, the more historically called, and I'm going to be changing this soon in my course and my coaching program, but this this labeled anxious or disorganized where you just so long for that there's so much healing in being a loving beautiful safe caretaker to your own family or your kids or your partner or yourself but if that is the only role you're you're taking in your life then you have to know that at some point you know you will come to bear the consequences of that okay so let's just go through some questions i'm just going to give you a general test it is from this book, The Caretaking Test, Stop Caretaking the Borderline or Narcissist, How to End the Drama. There are a lot of questions. I'm going to kind of modify them, but the bottom line is if you say yes more than no, then you probably do relate to being a compulsive caretaker, and we'll talk about it. Okay, the first one is I find it hard to say no, really to anyone, to your partner, to your kids. I often do not know what I want. So it's like, what do I want? What do I like? What do I want for dinner? What movies do I like? That sense of self can be kind of like sort of confusing or empty. I find myself angry or upset after talking to my partner or your kids if they're upset with you. Even when I say no, I don't want to do something, I find myself doing it anyway. When my partner says or my kids say hurtful things to me, I tend to hide my hurt. I am often very good at acting like I'm okay, I'm fine, when I'm not. I put up with a lot of things that other people say, yeah, like I would never put up with that. You know, you, you take a lot. 
you are really uncomfortable, I would say, in advocating for yourself and dealing, and dealing with any kind of conflict. You tend to avoid it. You find that your partner will say hurtful things um, to you and you just tell yourself that it's not that big of a deal. So you minimize, you actively tell yourself that you're overreacting or you're sensitive or it doesn't matter. You actually cover up for your partner or your kids and things that you know aren't okay without actually confronting or dealing with them. You expect yourself to be better than, more perfect, more responsible at everything. So you have to always show up at 110% in everything except for yourself and don't forget that's the hugest part of this is that you, you end up neglecting your own self your own self-care and this all serves this is really important this behavior keeps you numbed out exhausted and too busy and depleted and tired to deal with your own pain as a result of your attachment trauma your childhood wounds or your active current relational dynamics and wounds you often feel that people let you down. So you feel like you're just often really disappointed in how much other people give back compared to what you do. You feel like when your partner's upset or your kids, it is your job to always make them feel better. Like it's your job to make everyone happy is the heart of that. In fact, it's really uncomfortable for you when anybody is unhappy in your home or your relationships. You basically feel like it's up to you to always make things work. You can't be, like I said, happy if they're not happy. I think I just repeated that one. Um, you basically feel the most love often towards your partner or your family sometimes when they're not around. So when you're in it, it's so exhausting. It's almost like when you get the distance, you can really appreciate that love. Although you're angry at your kids or your partner or someone or your boss, you still try to please them. You basically feel that even when I feel hopeless about the relationship with my partner, I feel extremely guilty to think about leaving that person. Being rejected by my partner or someone is the worst kind of pain I can imagine. And I always kind of expect people to not really like me or be nice to me as one. So it's like if people are really nice to you, you're sort of suspicious. Like, why are they being so nice to me? You might find that you were bored in relationships that don't have any kind of like intensity or chaos to them, though you think of yourself as a relatively stable person. You kind of convince yourself that if you just try harder, if you just try harder to understand their diagnosis, their narcissism, their behaviors, the whole situation that you can tolerate and deal with the pain and wounding uh, that the partner gives to you in the relationship. So it's all about you trying harder while not really expecting them to, to be much more than they are. You try to anticipate people's needs before they have them. So you're like, you know, always jumping in front of things to prevent anything bad from happening, often because you have a hard time tolerating other people's discomfort with you, with themselves, just any emotions in that regard. You can feel nervous or anxious around your partner, especially if they're more of an eggshell partner. It's hard for you to let, you let yourself make mistakes, so you're very hard on yourself, as I said. It's hard to sit quietly in your thoughts and to reflect. Meditation might be really difficult for you. Now, this could be also from trauma and ADHD and all kinds of things, but the idea of like getting quiet in your mind, it feels like too much. So you often distract, numb, busy, binge watch TV, whatever. And you find it hard to outwardly express what you feel, and so you often take too much, and then you blow. So these are, these are just some of the dynamics. Basically, what you're doing is you're jumping in front and trying to anticipate and prevent and ignore and minimize and diminish anything around emotion with your partner or your kids or your relationships. And like I said, that's often to prevent that pain from emerging and you having to feel it in yourself. Because while you've been spending your whole childhood or adult life caretaking others, you often, as I said, are not caretaking yourself. So what can you do? You want to work on things like identity work. This is actually in the course I did on borderline and narcissistic parents, like just defining like, who are you? What do you love? What are your boundaries? What do you think? What do you believe? You know, what, what political things are important to you or what, are, what religious beliefs do you have? You know, what do you feel and believe? You want to work on setting boundaries. It's really important to say no and just, you know, what, what, what do I need to say no to? Like I can just stop saying, okay, it's fine to everything. You want to do emotion work, looking at how you manage and express emotions, how you avoid or numb your feelings, learning to communicate and express those things. Obviously, things like your nervous system. So hypervigilance is driving so much of this that learning how to manage those like triggers in your body, that scanning thing you do, you're probably never going to wake up and never do it. But a lot of this work, and you know, if, I, if my patients watch this, they'll know, I say like a lot of work in therapy at times is learning how to manage. It is not necessarily by getting over, over everything because that is just not possible in every case. And if anyone tells you that they just want your money or they're just 
they're full of it. That's just not possible. Um, basically, you want to look at um, where you neglect yourself, where you need more self-care. So you want to take that outside in orientation and kind of re reframe it and put the light back on yourself and say, what is the pain? What is happening for me? Maybe list like three things you want to start working on every week to improve your sense of focus on yourself. So not perfectly, but maybe you say, I'm okay, I'm going to exercise. I'm just going to try to walk. I'm a big proponent of just putting on your shoes, if the weather permits, and walking outside because cardio can do so much to help manage, not fix, but manage hypervigilance, which is often really just generalized and chronic anxiety the way it manifests. And then you want to look at triggers for hypervigilance, techniques, skills, that's all the breathing, the mindfulness, things like yoga, getting centered. I've been starting my day, trying to start my day for the first 30 minutes at a minimum, an hour is my goal, using the app Insight Timer and just listening to music, certain meditative music, different kinds of music you can search, but without words, and forcing myself to just sit in my own company, watch the rain, the birds, the fireplace, whatever, before I go, especially like on TikTok. Because once I find I'm on TikTok and I'm responding to videos and thinking I need to repost this and this needs to go to YouTube and my brain for the whole day is definitely spinning more and I never get that sense of calm. So it's important. And at the end of the day, you just really want to understand and work on that. You know, you arrived in the world this way. It is not your fault. And there is something truly beautiful, like I said, about these qualities you have and you don't want to lose those. Part of, part of that is what makes you who you are, but that there is a way to learn to take care of yourself and to stop do, you know, living that way and doing that kind of behavior because it will take so much from you and you will often end up feeling, like I said, at the, at the end of the day, like no one really cares about you. And that's often not the case. It's just that we have been an active participant in kind of enabling people and setting up our lives that way. And so that makes it really painful. Really quickly, last two things. If you're new here, please consider subscribing and joining my little growing community, which is actually getting bigger. I'm talking fast as I'm in a hurry today, um, which you guys know in the beginning I really struggled with. And also, I am uh, on, on TikTok pretty much every day posting one to five videos. I just took a week break, but I'm back and trying to post more things on skills. I know that you want more techniques and things. At times, that's difficult because I don't think that you can fix a lifetime issue with a 30 second TikTok advice. But I also do think that we can share tips and tools. And sometimes I think people are just like saying these like little poster platitudes like live, laugh, love, and you'll be free. And it's like, I think people like that stuff and they get a lot of views, but like, what does it actually mean? You know? And so I think I get myself stuck sometimes in the, like, I don't want to, I can't give therapy here, but I am going to try to post more of that because I know that you would like me to do that. And lastly, I'm finishing up my attachment coaching program, which is really going to go through a very deep dive, creating your own manual of your own attachment and personalized plan, covering everything from your childhood attachment wounds, trauma responses, um, how to deal with your attachment style and your the patterns and the parts. So I'm going to be reorganizing the theory using things like a, a bit of parts theory. I would like to stop using the words and go more to colors, which I'll, I'll explain more in a video. But there's going to be a program. It's a three-month program, and it's basically just 12 sessions. The goal is to do a deep dive for you to emerge with your own manual. And I am doing at the same time. It's not going to be ready at the same time, but it's probably about 60% done. An online course, like my other courses, specifically on creating your own attachment manual, which will cover your nervous system, hypervigilance, um, your patterns and parts, how to understand self-regulation, your maladaptive beliefs. Uh, I'll be listing that too, also with all the little categories, because every session, just like the lesson in the course, will have a targeted goal for you to work on. And then lastly, each of your the classic attachment styles, so whether you tend to lean, you know, not rigidly, but lean more into anxious, avoidant, or disorganized, there are specific manual modifications for each of those, and I will include all three of those in the online course, just because I think it's important that we all can have these different patterns and triggers and parts. And when I say parts, what I really mean is that, you know, if I have an anxious attachment with my mom, in some ways, I might have avoidant in others. And so it's not so just my mom was all these things, especially if you have a parent with emotional immaturity or something like borderline or narcissism where it wasn't always bad but when it was bad it was really bad and it gets confusing 
So that's today's video. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you're all surviving the weather. I know it's raining here in California. I think it's snowing on the beach, which I've seen TikToks of this morning. Have a beautiful day. Please stay safe and well, and I'll see you soon. Take care.